can start. Please, please go ahead and start. Okay. Hello, hello, everybody. This is Fred Hayes, Apollo 13 from uh, the States. Uh, wishing I could be uh, closer, uh, even in person, uh, for the uh, celebration uh, 50th anniversary since we uh, flew that mission uh, back in 1970. Uh, kind of auspicious with the current circumstances we have around the world. Uh, our mission, uh, in the week before uh, our flight, had, had a great challenge and threat of uh, a virus. Uh, we, we had all been exposed by Charlie Duke, who had gone to a birthday party with his son, to German measles, which is a virus, uh, although I'll have to say not near as threatening as the one uh, the world is dealing with uh, today. Nevertheless, though, it caused uh, us within the crew a traumatic uh, incident. Uh, we were all exposed, and through the blood work and testing, it was determined that Ken Manningly, uh, the primary crew uh, command module, which Jim Lovell and I had worked with, through a previous whole crew assignment, Apollo 11. We were the backup on Apollo 11. And here we were already going 13, and Ken was replaced, made the decision was made two and a half days before our launch that Jack Schweigert would replace Ken. So that was a, a very uh, traumatic uh, decision and kind of took away, for me, a little bit of the uh, excitement of going with that, just seeing uh, how, how distraught that was, I knew, for Ken to have worked that hard to get to this point and then be pulled off at the, uh, the last minute. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, just uh, should have known then that Apollo 13 wasn't going to be exactly the normal, uh, the normal mission. So uh, Ken ended up flying on Apollo 16 and had quite a good uh, space career. He, uh, he ended up doing a deep spacewalk, which uh, wasn't planned on 13, so I guess out of everybody, he was the big winner. Would you agree? I, I would agree. I think Ken is not, he really still feels like he, he wished he'd have been on the mission. Uh, he, of course, served, served well uh, on the ground uh, where he worked in the uh, special teams that uh, Gene Krantz had set up, uh, particularly with the uh, development of a procedure to turn on the command module. Uh, that Because... Uh, since the mothership, the command module was never intended to be turned off ever in flight. There was no procedure on how to how to turn it on. Not, normally, it was turned on on the launch pad with a lot of people involved in support equipment. And so this was the first time ever it was going to have to be turned on on the fly. And literally, it had to be a great procedure because they didn't turn Jack Schwager and I on to activate that vehicle until two and a half hours before entry. So we were sitting there in this cold, dark uh, spacecraft, knowing we we're going to enter in two and a half hours, and now had to power this thing up and hope it uh, would work well. Right. So I'm just curious, as, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, we do have uh, a number of the uh, Australian tracking station staff on on our session today. Do you, do you, did you have any awareness at the time of the global tracking network and the various stations and do you recall at all during the flight i suppose you were so busy any interactions or awareness of of uh, honeysuckle creek of parks of tibbin billa and those sites no i'd have to say i did not uh, the only thing i knew that something uh other than normal had been done was as part of the power saving uh, on board to make this two-day landing craft last uh, four days was we did not we were we did not uh, turn on our power amplifier uh, normally that might have gotten low bit rate uh, I guess from the lunar distance but probably would have not got high bit rate and certainly not TV when they had the bandwidth for TV but uh, I suspected that something different was being done on the ground to make sure they got high bit rate data so, so you may or may not be aware of this, and I probably won't explain it very well. But one of the challenges that uh, that that he experienced was the the transmitter on the on the Saturn third stage, which was kind of travelling in parallel with you, was was frequency transmitting on the same as the lunar module, right. which in the normal circumstances wouldn't be a problem. But in your mission, it was. So they had to spend time 
trying to separate the signals right. out, which uh, was quite a lot of work done in Australia and other parts of the world to make that happen. So I'm not yeah, sure. I, you... I, I, of course, was not aware of that. I knew we were having some communication problems, but I, I was, I did not was not aware of the uh, exactly why. Uh, I assumed it was kind of like vehicle attitude because uh, it was it was changing uh, in that time, and, and maybe that was it. Uh, we'd lost uh, signal strength. Right, and and uh, Fred, your recollections of of going around the moon and and seeing the moon, um, obviously a unique experience. It was uh, actually entirely uh, entirely the views out the window, uh, even from low Earth orbit. We we went in orbit barely over 100 miles and only went around a couple of times. But the views uh, there and, of course, going out toward the moon and back and at the moon itself were uh, at times, uh, to me, almost seemed unreal. Am I, am I really sitting here looking at what I'm looking at? It was one of the two things that was uh, quite different from all my years of uh, aircraft flying, both in the military and uh, as a test pilot for NASA for seven years. Uh, that just that's those views. The, the second thing, uh, most unusual in space flight was the uh, zero gravity, of course, be able to float around. Uh, other than that, though, the uh, rocket ride, uh, vibration levels, G levels there, or entry, uh, were less than I experienced in airplanes. So it wasn't that, wasn't that big a deal. But the view around the moon was uh, uh, most spectacular to me because of the difference. I saw in the backside, you know, obviously we, we all our lives have looked at the front side of the moon. That's the only side we look at. But how, how much more rugged and uh, beat up it looked. It had, did not have, of course, we only saw a little over half the backside. Uh, we couldn't see the whole backside. But it only had a few of these, uh, what I call Mars, uh, dark uh, areas, like the huge ones on the front side. Some people can even see a face of the moon. Uh, but uh, we did get, capture some good pictures of two very prominent ones, uh, Sierkowski, uh, which has a nice uh, mountainous looking feature right in its center. Uh, Sierkowski was, I guess, a, a rocket uh, scientist. He was an early rocketeer, like Dr. Goddard was in the United States. And the other one was the Sea of Moscow. But other than that, it was just crater after crater after crater. And I'm sure if you had better uh, definition you'd have seen craters within those craters <laughs> but the whole backside was just ve very rugged uh which tells you that somehow i don't know if it's earth's attraction that sucked them in but the bigger bigger meteorites obviously had hit more on the side facing us to create those big mars or seas right right so, something that you experienced which which uh um you never hear spoken about very often is the earth re-entry uh, uh what what was your recollections of that i guess one of the things that you were worried about was whether you were going to your spacecraft was going to be intact and hold together but putting that aside the rest of the of the re-entry how 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 did that feel uh well first of all the, the correct i think you were applying the heat shield the heat i shield. never i never thought of the heat shield in fact that it would be damaged it, you know it, to me it's pretty tough material and the damage we saw on the service module when we separated looked pretty much like that panel blew out sideways, uh, went straight out and tore up a lot of stuff as it went out, you know, thermal blankets, some of the electrical uh, wiring in there. Uh, it, and it did not look like it would have impacted downward toward the uh, capsule. So I felt that we probably, even if it might have briefly crossed my mind, that I never thought the heat shield would be a problem. What well, was uh, probably the only uh, two two unusual things. Uh, first one, uh, we obviously were still freezing. It was still pretty cold in there. It had not warmed up significantly. And we got rained on a little bit because water had built up over everything. Uh, in those days, in that very cold environment, the water separator uh, was well below its specifications and it could not remove moisture like we're breathing out moisture. And it was evident in the limb as well, even before we left it. And that uh, water fell out from behind the panel. So we had a little light rain shower uh, right at the top of entry as the G's started building up. 
the other thing that was really incredible uh, was the uh, condition after being frozen for four days. The water tanks were fro found frozen when they recovered it on board the ship in the command module. So it had gone below freezing, well below uh, specifications for all, certainly all the avionics, electronics. And that vehicle had come to life and it and, and it was flown. Jack was ready to take over should it not perform well, but it did. It, through the computer, automated, it flew that trajectory. And if you look at the post-flight data for the whole, the whole Apollo program, we tied for the second most accurate splashdown of the program. Wow. Uh, which is you know, incredible uh, for, that, for that ship to have been abused uh, for four days and then come to life and uh, do that job. So, so do you ever go back and visit uh, your uh, uh, um, your spacecraft, the Odyssey? Is it? Oh uh, yes. In fact, in fact, I would have been there. Uh, today's what? April tenth. Uh, six days ago, I would have been at the Cosmosphere in Kansas. We we had, pl had planned an Apollo thirteen celebration that, there on that day, April fourth. And of course, this virus uh, uh, changed a lot of things, including that. And so I did not get to go back, but we'd only held those uh, celebrations, uh, all, not every year, but quite a few of the years, uh, because that, that's where our capsule is. Right, and so in recent years, you've been involved in the Infinity Science Center in, in Mississippi, is that right? Yes, yeah. it's, uh, it's the first building you see as you come along Interstate 10, a major thoroughfare from Louisiana, into Mississippi. It's it's on the right, the first thing you'll see entering Mississippi. And you get there by getting off at that first exit. And to the north at that exit is Stennis Space Center. Oh, I see. And, right, so we're in somewhat in partnership with NASA. They use our uh, Infinity as their visitor center. Uh, because of all the security rules, they, people can't just run around like they used to out at the center. So our facility furnishes uh, the public view of infinity. In fact, uh, one of our galas, the Space Gallery, uh, tries to do that job as well as cover NASA overall. Uh, one gallery upstairs is the Space Gallery. Now, I haven't uh, been there myself. I'd love to get there, but I believe at the front of that uh, museum, is you've got a unique connection to a piece of hardware out there. Is that right? I'm sorry, at the front is connection with what? A piece of hardware on display there, the Saturn V oh, yeah. first stage. How yeah, does that? We, we have a, on the west side of the. I think you're talking about the west side of the building. We have a Saturn V first stage, full with engines. It was the last one that had been built at the Michou facility, you know, uh, 50 years ago, roughly, and it had actually been shipped to Stennis with all five engines on a barge up the Pearl River and then into uh, Stennis and the, the waterways they built, man-made uh, canals, to be tested. They fired all five engines on that stage to have it ready to go to Kennedy Space Center. And they got caught with the cancellations of Apollo 18 and 19. So theoretically, I, I like it there because it's, uh, if I had got to fly 19, I backed up John Young on Apollo 16, which put me in a rotation to fly 19. Uh, that's the first stage that would have lifted me off the pad again, uh, get, get on my way to the moon. We wow. also have a full-scale lunar module sitting next to it now. It came from Kennedy. It was our training mock-up uh, that we got in to start all our EBA training down at Kennedy on that practice lunar field. We'd always start in that mock-up to go through all the procedures, getting ready to go out and uh, then go out on that uh, lunar field and do our, you know, four hour plus uh, EVA exercise. Right, and uh, you backed up uh, John Young on 16. 16, 16. And yeah. as, as part of that uh, training, did you fly the lunar landing training vehicle? Yes, I flew uh, it 22 times. Wow, how how was that? That apparently that's supposed to be quite a was, piece of. Uh, as Neil had said, you know, at the time Neil uh, ejected, and then after the mission, they were really thinking they would get rid of it. 
NASA management. Because they crashed two of them, actually three of them, and ended up three three of them were lost. Joe Algrani uh, jumped out of another one, had a closer shave than Neil. He only got about one swing of the chute before he hit the ground. And Stu Present jumped out, sitting straight and level at 500 feet when he lost electric power. Wow. Uh, a NASA pilot. So uh, they were ready to give up on that machine. Uh, but Neil told them, he said, if you want people to land on the moon. Uh, the the uh, task and the stress level provided by this trainer is what you ought to have the person have that background experience to do the job right. So Neil's the one who kind of talked NASA management out of that thought. And so all uh, commanders uh, got quite a few flights in the machine. Right. No, it was, uh, it was somewhat dicey uh, in that uh, the, t the way you set up and the task you had put you into a time-limited situation for fuel, just like you would be in the moon. Of course, the exception was you had a bailout. You had a plan B. You could switch out of the simulation mode and then uh, depend and, and fly on... Uh, <laughs> you got and a fly, crew, crew member with and, you there. And fly on your jet engine and, uh, and just use the little attitude thrusters and more easily, pretty easily land just using the jet engine. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't as bad as landing on the moon in that sense, at least. For sure, for sure. And after, after Apollo, you, you stayed with NASA um, and helped in the development of the, the space shuttle, the, the approach and landing tests. Uh, yes, I actually, the, the way I helped first was I uh, transferred from the astronaut office and I went to work for Aaron Cohen and the Orbiter Project Office. So I really, for four years, I went into program management on shuttle. And I served on the evaluation team that uh, evaluated the four proposals that came in to pick who would build it, Rockwell, as it turned out. And uh, so I was uh, Aaron's uh, technical assistant, if you will, throughout that time, served on the uh, change board, evaluating all engineering changes. I uh, led the ops team which is a mix of astronauts, mission controllers, our training people, uh, to review the designs as we went through through the series of designs. Uh, typically, you go through for the development of a vehicle from program re review to system review to preliminary design review to the critical design review that which kind of commits you to build it at that point, cut metal. And so I led the uh, ops team through all the design reviews through CDR, on Enterprise, and I led the team on preliminary design review on Columbia. Before then, I got reassigned to the astronaut office uh, and named as a commander of Crew One to go now fly Enterprise. So it's very much a womb to tomb experience. I was there from day one of the paper proposals coming in to now get to fly that vehicle for the first time. So I look, I look at it actually as the uh, crowning. Uh, uh, achievement of my uh, total career. Oh wow! Oh. So, so d during that time, Fred, uh, in the development, design, etc., of the of the space shuttle, as we now know later on, it it failed to meet all of the sort of cost uh, and schedule targets and um, uh, plans that it had to make it a very economical and rapid turnaround vehicle. Right. Were you aware of that at the time or was... was th uh, pretty, pretty early. See, the, 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 the fallacy of the, of the uh, what sold shuttle and, and to be in that uh, vogue, if you will, was uh, assuming uh, you could achieve a certain uh, flight rate. And at the, at the time, uh, early on, it, it, was, uh, it was thought that we could make 24 flights a year launched 24 times a year. Now, if you spread 24 flights a year over the same, call it overhead burden of labor, uh, material and whatever, you know, the, the, the cost obviously is lower. And of course, I think the most in any one year ever flown was eight, I think one year. And so that, that was the fallacy. Uh, we also uh, you have to realize again, even though we were now in the, the 70s and uh, 80s, uh, t technology still wasn't quite far along to do what we might do today more with that kind of vehicle is automation. Uh, 
even on the ground processing. So we were very, very labor intensive. And if you look at recurring costs, a big part of recurring cost is the payroll. How many people you have employed to make to hap- make that happen? We also, because of weight uh, drivers, uh, we had Air Force people involved early on, uh, trying to coach us on maintenance and what provisions to make for maintenance that would make it faster, easier, more efficient. And some of those added weight. Some of the the ways they would have done it that they would normally do on an airplane. And so uh, we threw out some of that that might have helped also the situation. So now I would like to make a, a B model someday. I don't think that'll happen very soon. But with the learning, uh, you know, learning we have on that first one, uh, we could probably do a much better job in that regard with, today, again, today's capability, particularly computing power. You have to realize Enterprise I flew, its computer was like one megabyte. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it was at IBM 101. We inherited uh, that had been on the, on the B1 program and the manned already laboratory program, the Air Force uh, program that got canceled. Uh, most people don't realize where we were in computers then. Can think, can, now, you know, you, can, uh, you, you can't even buy anything less than about a... 16 uh, gigabyte uh, thumb drive, you know, and they, and it wasn't too long ago you could only buy even an eight or something that was big. Uh, so the computing uh, assets have grown tremendously. We flew to the moon, you know, in one tenth of a megabyte. Wow. Hand wired. Well, there were no chips yet then, so that was a hand wired uh, machine we went to the moon with. Um, going back to Apollo 13, <laughs> did, did you? Uh, I assume followed the investigation fairly closely about what exactly happened. How did how did that make you feel? And and were you angry that decisions and things had been made the way they were, or was it something else? Uh, no, I know I wasn't angry. Uh, it's uh, it's, er- it's er- it was errors made, uh, like the instrumentation they provided to poor tech when they. Uh, uh, used the heaters to uh, get rid of the oxygen in the tank. Uh, they topped out at a reading uh, at, a, at a point well below the red line. So the, the poor tech was sitting there observing, and of course it exceeded the red line, but the meter didn't track where it had gone to in the tank. So, you know, you can't say that that was human error. It was whoever arranged the setup uh, for this exercise they did of detanking uh, one oxygen tank. Uh, but this is this is several weeks before launch, actually, in the wet countdown we did. No, you could say uh, configuration control was a problem, and that uh, beach uh, in their upgrading of the tanks on that particular tank had not upgraded the uh, thermostats to be compatible with higher voltage that was used at the Cape, which was, I think, 60-some-odd volts, whereas it had been, you know, pretty much for spacecraft power, which is about 30... 28 normally, but could I think 32.5 was our normal high on the DC bus. So uh, they, you know, they, they missed that. Uh, but uh, you, you have to think again of the uh, this world of uh, computing assets and, and capability. Today, all that kind of configuration control is computerized. Then everything was paper, paper system. Uh, everything had to be uh, written, signed off, sometimes uh, one, even double stamped sometimes by a person, by a quality person for the company, by a quality person for NASA, all paper. And so you think of having a paper that tracked the number of pieces and parts in that Saturn V rocket and two spacecraft, and that's, if that's the only error ever made was on our thermostats, that wasn't too bad, I guess, considering the way it was done. For sure, for sure. It was amazing. And yeah. uh, and here we are 50 years later and we're still um, struggling to get uh, to get the Artemis program up and, and running. And how, Have you been tracking, following that much? Have you got thoughts on that at all? Uh, uh, only what, what I you know can read in the media. I'm not, I'm not involved with NASA or any of the companies uh, directly. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the worrisome thing is, as it has been really since Apollo, 
is will it uh, be funded adequately uh, so it can keep moving and you don't end up with stalls and stops and eventually, like Constellation, be canceled. That's the threat. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's not it's the people, it's the old story. Apollo was unique in that we had a mission defined and it had pretty much the full backing uh, politically, a uh, president through uh, Congress, and was funded properly, uh, at least through Apollo 11. There was some back off of the funding following that, but at least up to meeting the goal, uh, it was fully funded per uh, program plan. And uh, the shuttle had that problem initially. I, in the program office I was in for Orbiter, uh, we were somewhat underfunded from the program plan for the first three years. And that's what made us end up with deletions. We, we had a second enterprise, the one I flew, we had a backup vehicle. Normally, if you run a test program, you want more, one, one more than one vehicle in case something does go wrong. Air Force normally will fly a non initial test program with six or seven prototypes. Uh, so anyway, we, we canceled the second enterprise. We turned our structural test article, OB-99, into a flight vehicle. That became Challenger. That was that hull was never supposed to be a flight vehicle. All oh, right. So, so we saved building another hull. Uh, we canceled test articles. The only thermal vac testing we did in the Cecil Chambers was one payload bay door and one ohms pod. We said we'll test it on orbit. That's what we did. We put enough thermocouples on Columbia. Uh, the early flights did a lot of, quote, thermal testing on orbit, not in a chamber like we did in Apollo. Wow. Vibroacoustic, uh, we, we kept the F-sectioned vibroacoustic article. Vibroacoustic is where, that's the sound waves and the pressure from the uh, engine thrust at, you know, at launch. And, but we canceled the crew cabin. That's, that worried me at the time we did that. A lot of arguing about it, I'll tell you. Because... The facility we did those tests in to test that F section, we had to add horns in there to create the DB level because it was higher than Apollo. Because the orbiter sits a lot closer to those engines. You know, our capsule and the service module were way up on the tippy top on the Saturn. So we had, a, we were, on shuttle, we were facing a higher DB level acoustic. Uh, uh, stress than we had in Apollo. And so we deleted one of our two major test articles for that. Wow. So those kind of things were done to say to take money out and still try to hold schedule, which is always your driving thing because you're always worried about what's going to happen when you change administration too. Where one president started the program and here you're going to go through the cycle maybe with a new leader and how he will feel about it and how he, he might continue to support it. For sure, for sure. So, Fred, you chose uh, not to stay with NASA and fly in the shuttle. I, I assume that was an option for you. You just decided you'd had enough and want to do something different or what? Well, the main thing was the mission changed. Uh, I was assigned uh, with Jack uh, Lausma to fly the third orbital mission. And it was an exciting mission. We were going to go rendezvous and save Skylab and keep it from dropping in Australia, I guess, parts of it. <laughs> and uh, or boosted higher, depending on what, what the policy decision makers would have decided. But we're going to fly up in rendezvous and hit a little kick stage that was well along in development. It was past CDR and they were putting parts together uh, by Lockheed Martin in Colorado. Fly it in a payload bay and Jack actually was going to remotely fly it over to dock it with Skylab and then the people on the ground would actually orient Skylab the right direction to either positive grade or retrograde to boost it or deorbit it. And that mission went away. And then it, it all was left with some RMS arm checks and part of that thermal testing I mentioned on orbit, to sit in various attitudes for certain lengths of time, collecting thermocouple data. And the mission just wasn't that interesting to me as, as it had been. And I had the opportunity at that time to join Grumman. In long range, I was thinking of more going into the executive program management side. So that the opportunity came by and I took it and I had 17 uh, 
good years with uh, Grumman. One of the contracts I had, interestingly, uh, one of the large ones was uh, with a team with Lockheed and Tycoll. I turned around shuttles on the ground for 12 years at Kennedy. I had the, what's called shuttle processing, con processing contract for 12 years. And then I actually left the division, uh, a, a subsidiary company I had doing service business for Grumman to go to Washington and led a contract we'd want to do the system engineering and integration on Space Station Freedom. So I did that for four years in Washington for the early Space Station Freedom, the one that didn't ultimately get built. Uh, ISS ended up being a slightly different configuration. But those were an interesting time. You talk about, talk about short money. That program was underfunded from day one. Is that right? Wow. Uh, Oh yeah, it was it was a it was a horrible challenge uh, to try to hold that thing together. Fortunately, uh, uh, the the Russians uh, joined the program. That's what solidified it politically. That uh, had Congress uh, properly funded to eventually uh, get ISS on the road. Oh, I'm going to wrap up here, Sudfet. Just want, I'm going to go back to Apollo. You and I met each other in person for the first time, which was wonderful back in 2018 at Space Fest, and. I'm not sure whether you caught the, the fact there, but uh, there was one of the exhibitors there had an Apollo computer that right. they were they were restoring and getting up and running. Right. Did you have a look at that? I believe you were a bit of a computer expert back in the Apollo era. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, I looked at it. I mean, he had a, it was a complete machine, and he had a disky, uh, which was the little keyboard uh, that we use with this kind of weird syntax. <laughs> You had a, a verb noun uh, kind of syntax, but uh, it appeared to be working. Now I actually there's no way of checking without hooking it up with some simulation of sorts to say run the entry program and see if you really had all the ones and zeros in the right place in there. But uh, it was as far as a it was a true a true machine, a flight machine uh, in every respect. Fantastic. All right, Fred. Well, thank you so much for today. Do you want, want to say a last few words, and uh, and we'll we'll wrap it up. Well, I, I just say again, I wish we wasn't under this uh, cloud, if you will, of this uh, thing, and uh, that we were all uh, free to go back to our normal lives. Because I'm, uh, I think that the the term uh, used in the states for this uh, staying at home is hunkering down. <laughs> and I'm getting kind of tired of hunkering down uh, myself. I assume a lot of other people are, but it's uh, unfortunately, I guess, the only way we're going to put this thing to bed and get to the other side. So I do. I wear, uh, feel kind of funny, but I wear a mask and uh, wear rubber gloves. Uh, I do have a mask that was a footprint made for me. It's actually got a space symbology. You got six of them. So it's got actually a rocket that kind of looks like the Saturn V right about where my nose is. Fantastic. But anyway, I can, I can wear that when I go out. Wonderful. So well, anyway, ha ha have a happy time, everybody, and I hope this, uh, your, your in inter internet uh, works out on the web to have this gathering. Thank you so much, Fred. And um, once again, thank you so much for taking time. Do look after yourself <clears throat> and, well, uh, and, your, and your wife. And... Um, um, enjoy your 50th anniversary, uh, however oh, yeah. you're going to be able to do it. Likewise, everybody else, take care of yourselves. Thank you take so care. much, Fred. Thank you. Bye -bye. I'll talk to you sometime soon. Okay.